You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. This is the Eric John Phelps Show on 24-7 World Radio. And now, Eric John Phelps. And again, I say welcome to the broadcast today on this beautiful Wednesday August 3rd, 2016. I had originally planned not to be on today, but the Lord enabled me to be so, do so. So um, I was praying this morning, Lord, what do you want me to preach on today? And immediately, Revelation 19 came to my mind, <clears throat> which is, of course, the second coming of the Mashiach. The very God, very man. The Lord of hosts. The El Gibor. Mighty God. The great Jehovah the Son himself. Sent by Jehovah the Father. From which the Son proceeded. Because the Son is one in essence with the Father. And yet a distinct person from the Father. When he comes back, it's going to be a fearful day. It's going to be a day of stark terror for the nations that have decided to forget God and led by their satanic secret societies Busy serving the devil, be they call that being Lucifer or whatever they want to call him, his name in the Bible today is Satan. The Lord Jesus Christ never called Satan Lucifer because Satan is no longer Lucifer. Lucifer was not evil. Lucifer was God's greatest creation. He was the most musical, the most beautiful, the most intelligent. You read Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. There was no creation as great or as powerful as Lucifer himself when he had the body of a cherub. The face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of an ox, the face of a of a uh, of a lion. You read the description of the cherubim in Ezekiel chapter one and Ezekiel ten, and you see that there they, a cherub has four distinct faces, all reflecting the four distinct aspects of the coming Mashiach. The coming son of man. The coming promised seed of the woman. The coming promised seed of Abraham. The coming promised seed of David. The one with royal ruby red droplets of blood in his veins. Whose blood was different. Blood in the veins of an immortal. Of an invader from outer space taking upon himself the form of a servant and submitting himself to the death, the ignominious, awful, despicable, horrifying death of Calvary and what he would go through there for six hours, especially the last three hours. For us. At his first coming, he's the Lamb of God. John one twenty nine. 
the prophet says, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. But then that very prophet in a moment of weakness, when he was in prison, would send a message to that prophet, to the one of that prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, and he would say, Art thou the one that should appear or shall we look for another? Every man of God, the greatest man of God who ever lived, born of a sinful woman, of sinful flesh, was John the Baptizer. John the Baptizing One. And even he doubted. So don't, so don't worry about it when you doubt sometimes. It's just our flesh. Our flesh hates God. Our flesh wants nothing to do with God. Our flesh wants to forget God. Our flesh hates God. That's right, my brother in Christ. We have a nature in us that absolutely hates God. That nature manifests itself in me every day. I get a thought, oh my God, I confess it, Lord. Don't entertain it. The Lord cleanses me and, and, and cleanses me of that unrighteousness, but it's a, it arises because of the horrible, evil, sinful flesh that we have. And thank God, one of these days, those of us in Christ, when we die and we get our glorified bodies to be just like Christ, we're not going to have the fleshly nature anymore. We're never going to have an impure thought. Our minds will be just like Christ. Perfect. Absolutely perfect without spot or blemish or any such thing for eternity as we think upon things of God, fellowship with His people, walk on the streets in Jerusalem, New Jerusalem with the Son of God, reign with Him in the thousand-year reign of the Davidic kingdom. We're going to have a mind of Christ. We will not be capable of sinning. What a thought. So that's what we have coming for us, those of us in Christ. If you're not in Christ today, my friend, you need to truly repent. Turn from your idols and dead works to serve the one true God by believing that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again according to the Scriptures, that He is your only Savior and you need no other. The Lord said, I am the Savior. There is none else beside me. And furthermore, that he would not give his authority to another. The Lord Jesus Christ as Savior of the world and head of his church, the body of Christ, will not give his power, his jurisdiction, his authority to anybody else. Thank God. Is there anybody else as a sinner? And has evil, wicked, selfish desires to fulfill for the fulfillment of his flesh, especially the Pope of Rome, that wicked sinner, that diabolical detractor of the great magnificence and glory of the Son of God. How dare he say he's the vicar of Christ? That's right, Jesuits. How dare he say he's the vicar of Christ? That despicable Jesuit, Bergoglio, now quote unquote Pope of Rome working with that other despicable Jesuit, Adolfo Nicholas, who's getting ready to retire here, as he is advised and helped out by the former Jesuit Superior General, Peter Hans Kolbenbach. All these despicable Jesuits, the three most powerful men in the world, all three Jesuits, running the government, the military government of the United States for their benefit, for their designs. Because these Jesuits hate God. They hate Him. They hate His people. They hate His book. They hate, every, they hate Jerusalem in the hands of anybody other than themselves. Remember, Loyola went to Jerusalem. In what, like 1523 or so, he made a, a, a pilgrimage, quote-unquote, to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem in an attempt to set up capital, his capital city for his Jesuit order that he had yet to found in 1534. Thank God the Franciscans ran him off. He hates 
God. He hates the church, the true body of Christ. He hates the racial Hebrew Jewish Israelites. The hatred that unsaved men have for the Jewish race, the Hebrew Jewish Israelitish race, all the same term. Apostle Paul was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. He was an Israelite. Prove it from two different texts many times. The hatred that the papacy has and that Islam has and that the Buddhists have and that the Hindus have for the Hebrew, Jewish, Israelitish people, 98% of the world's population hate their guts simply because the devil has put into their heart and incited their flesh to do so because the devil hates the whole concept of the Abrahamic covenant where one day God will give to this special race of people the promise that he gave to Abraham and they will one day dwell in their land in safety and none shall make them afraid. The devil hates it. And unsaved people hate it. It's natural, pursuant to the flesh, to not only hate God, but to hate everything connected with him. Now, if you're not saved today and you're offended, I'm glad you are, because that's why I'm here. I'm to offend you with the truth. An old black preacher said to me one time, he says, you got to get him mad, then you get him sad, and then you get him glad. Glad. Mad, glad, sad. Mad, sad, glad. That's right. Mad, you're outraged at the preaching of the gospel, then you're repentant, truly sorrow, a godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. And then ultimately, you're happy in the Lord. We have the joy of the Lord now that we're saved. It's a tripartite process. You get mad, and then sad at repentance, and believe of the gospel, and then glad, having a joy unspeakable and full of glory. But before that time, friends, we all hate God. You know what the communist has in common with the fascists? They all hate God. You know what Hillary Clinton has in common with Donald Trump? They both hate God. Because neither one of them has ever said yes I came to the place in my life where I realized that I was a terrible person. I was a sinner. I was without God, without hope in the world, dead in my trespasses and sins. Neither one of them would ever say that. They're both a couple of self-righteous hypocrites hating God every day. And another sign of that is neither one of them has a preacher. Neither one of them has a real preacher preaching not only to them, but to those that are listening. Yeah, then they'd never get elected, would they? The preacher come out and denounce and renounce, denounce adultery, denounce bisexuality, denounce transgenderism, denounce sodomy, denounce abortion, denounce everything that these parties are either defending or advocating. Denounce gun control, denounce gun confiscation, any preacher worth his salt is going to denounce any attempt to take away our guns. Because he knows that when the church, the body of Christ, is disarmed, we're massacred. Just like we were massacred in Stalin's Russia. Just like we were massacred in Mao Zedong, heavy on the dung, his communist China. Just like we were massacred in Hitler's Germany. Remember, they rounded up the, the true Protestant there and called them enemies of the state. The SS rounded up the, the, the uh, preachers, the Dutch Reformed preachers of the Netherlands. They had a special concentration camp for those guys. The fascists and the communists worked together under the Jesuit general, killing those whom the Council of Trent has accursed, and that's us, us Bible-believing men of God, who renounce and denounce the wickedness of popery, the Jesuits, all secret societies, to the end that may God wake up his people, and they might too start doing the same thing. We hate God, folks. This is what the Roman Catholics and the Muslims have in common. They both hate God. This is what the Jews have in common with the Catholics and the Muslims. They all hate God. Unless these certain racial Jews have been saved, 
pursuant to Romans 9, 10, and 11. But the Judaistic religion imbibes hatred for the one true God. They won't even call him by his name. They call him Yashem. Yashem. He's not Hashem. He's Jehovah. For the Muslims, he's not Allah. He's Jehovah. And he has a son named Jesus, Yeshua. For the Hindus, he's not Krishna. He's Yeshua. He's Jesus. Listen, all these religions hate God. Is it any wonder why there's war everywhere? The Bible is clear when it says, there's no peace for the wicked, saith the Lord. They're in their wickedness by the very doctrines that they believe and preach. And they all have this wickedness in common that they all hate God and they hate his son, the only mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of Romanism. The Jesus of Romanism and the Jesus of the Bible are two separate, distinct individuals. One's a fake and the other really lived in time and space. This Jesus of Nazareth. Which one do you believe on? Which one do you hate? It can only be Jesus of Nazareth, who came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, and who's coming a second time without sin unto salvation, who shall roar as a lion out of heavenly Mount Zion from Jerusalem when he comes back to the earth to punish the world for its wickedness, for its violation and breaking of the everlasting covenant, particularly for the constant and ceaseless persecution of the Hebrew Jewish Israelites, which is their lot for their violation and breaking of Mosaic law and the rejection of their Messiah who could have saved them from the dominance and mass murder of the Romans and then on and on for the last 2,000 years. But that can change for you today, my friend. Individually for you, it can change today. By believing in the true gospel, being saved by the grace of God, to no longer hate God. Because if you're not saved, you do. Back in a moment, after prayer. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. hear a message from very many preachers on the hatred of God. Man's hatred for God. Because you see, we all want to think we're pretty good. There's a little light in all of us by God's dignity. There ain't no light in us! Except the light of conscience, knowing good and evil, and the reality of the fact that we generally choose evil left to ourselves. You know why no man can come to Christ apart from the Father drawing him? Because no man wants to come to Christ. I maintain they could believe the gospel if they want, but they won't. All men hate God. And so therefore, God has to bring a ministry of the Spirit of God to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, which oftentimes includes physical problems. For me, it was a broken leg. I'm going to take your health. I'm going to take your girlfriend. I'm going to take everything from you. And so you're going to find yourself sitting in your bed one day, bereft of anything that you can boast about, so that I can introduce my son to you as you read the book of John. That's how I was saved. So, We all suffer under this horrible, terrible disease, this disease of sin. And the manifestation of this disease is that we hate God. We want nothing to do with him. We run from him. Just as Adam ran from God in the garden. Here he comes. Oh, we got to hide. Oh, yeah, we got to hide. Instead of running up and saying, oh, Lord, we sinned. I'm sorry. Oh, we got to hide. Let's cover up our nakedness now. Let's get a little Masonic apron. That's where the first Masonic apron was created. That's right, by Adam. That's right, Masons. 
Your Masonic little apron was first started by Adam in seeking to cover up his nakedness with his own righteousness. With his own works. Oh, we'll weave together some things here so we're naked. Not naked. He can't see us anymore. Ridiculous. But thank God Adam and Eve were saved. They believed the promise that a seed would come. A seed of the woman that would bruise the seed of the serpent. Bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. And the Lord then killed a couple of lambs. And tied their hides immediately and then clothed them with Sheepskins. The righteousness of the Lamb of God. They were clothed with the expectant reality that the Lamb of God would come and they would be clothed with His righteousness, having their sins washed away with the blood of His Son. What happens to Cain? Cain kills, he murders his brother Abel. Lord says to Cain, don't bring your fruit of the ground there, Cain. Don't do that. Don't bring your garden fruit. You've got to bring the blood of a lamb, one of the, fe- of one of the f- uh, first things of the first fruits there, the first fruits of the feastlings, of, of one of the, the nicest of your lambs. You bring that, Cain, and I'll accept you. Cain says, ah, ah, I hate God. God, if you want a sacrifice, I'll give you one. I'll give you my brother. Yeah, he accepted him. And so Cain rises up, stabs Abel, murders him. His blood cries out to God, Vengeance! I want vengeance on Cain! I'm Cain. I killed my brother. I gave God a blood sacrifice. Just what he wanted. The Lord says to Cain, I'm marking you. And he didn't mark him with black skin, by the way. He created the black race through ham. Here, who knows what the race is. But he marks Cain with something on his forehead. So that men would see him, they wouldn't kill him. For the intent that by conscience, to see if conscience was enough, knowing that Cain had sinned against the Lord, that he would repent. So the Lord made him a wanderer. You know what Cain does? No, I'm not going to wander. I'm going to build myself a city. I'm going to build a city where we, all of us sinners can get together and reinforce us in our wicked sin. We can have our burlesque places. We can have our strip joints. We can have everything there. We are not going to be wandering with a guilty conscience lest we should actually repent and turn to God. There's an old saying, God made the country, man built the towns, and the devil built the cities. And I tend to agree with that. Apart from one city, the new Jerusalem, praise God. So Cain goes off, he builds a city, reinforcing each other in their righteousness, in their unrighteousnesses. They get so bad in 1,656 years that God says, I got to destroy mankind. The sons of God have come down. They've copulated with women, human women. They've they've created a whole race of giants. The giants rule the earth. Earth is one one landmass. There's no continents at this time. The earth is flat. Never a globe. And the earth is ruled by these super creatures, the sons of God and their half-breed offspring, offspring, the Nephilim, the giants. The devil seeking to corrupt every single last seed of man that they would be half part angelic so that Messiah, son of man, would not be entirely man. And if he had any blood of the sons of God in him, he couldn't have been the savior. So the devil's out to corrupt the messianic seed by race mixing. Race mix the sons of God with the sons of men so we can have these offspring that can never qualify for Messiah. So the Lord says, you know, I'm going to destroy all this. All flesh has been corrupt before my sight. The imagination of the heart of man, even from his youth, is continually evil. I'm destroying mankind. I'm going to leave six, eight people to survive in the ark of Noah. And so as Noah gets out of the ark, 
continues his family and his three sons continue their families over a period of years, 500 years or so, they all get together in a plain called the Plain of Shinar, Babylon. The Lord created the races, the whites from Japheth, the blacks from Ham, the Shemites, the Asians uh, from uh, uh, Shem. The Lord creates the races to keep mankind separate. Not to hate each other, but to prefer one another. Blacks prefer blacks. Whites prefer whites. Asians prefer, prefer, prefer Asians. And you break that down nationally, it even goes deeper than that. Because it's God's design and ordination for man after the terrible failure of one race, one language, one culture, on one piece of ground to unite against God and hate his guts. And so what do they do after the flood? Well, they all get together again. We've got one, one great big race-mixing, interracial, amalgamated party for commerce and war. Commerce and war under a black man named Nimrod. The most powerful man of his day. The black antichrist of the Old Testament. And Nimrod is going to lead all the people in a huge miscegenation, race mixing and amalgamation, kind of like what's done here in America right now. We're under Nimrod Obama. Now it's just going to be Nimrodius uh, uh, Hellcat Hillary. It's going to be Jezebel or Isis. Call her what she thinks she is. She thinks she's Isis getting out there in that white, that white pantsuit there, the Democratic nomination. Why, here comes Isis. Oh, the queen of heaven. Oh, God, deliver us. And so they get together at Babylon in the plains of Shinar, and it's one great big race mix-up party for, for some time. And Nimrod was a hunter of men. He was a warlord. And people followed him as the great strong man. And the Lord says, you know what? This is, I've had enough. They, they, nothing can be withheld from them and what they seek to do. They're huge builders. They're, they're, they're great uh, engineers. Building this huge tower into the heavens. So I'm going to disperse them when I create the languages. And I'm going to divide the races up by languages now. And then shortly after that, I'm going to start to, I'm going to divide up the flat one earth into seven different continents. In the days of Peleg was the earth divided. Genesis 10, 25. You see, God wanted man separate. God wants man to be known by his race, by his language, by his culture, and the geographic borders in which he lives. That's God's design. Not interracialism, internationalism, internationalism. That's all sin. Every time I get in this one airplane, I think it's American Airlines, one world, it makes me want to throw up. One world. I don't want one world. I want all the nations with their distinctions under God maintaining their race, language, and culture, and their distinctive dress, and their distinctive cuisine. How beautiful it is. Would you like to have McDonald's everywhere? Huh? Would you like to have everybody speaking English? Everybody speaking English. Everybody going to McDonald's. Everybody wearing jeans. Everybody getting tattooed. Everybody getting pierced. Everybody looking like the same, 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 same. Well, you know what? God has instituted certain things that can never happen. He's created the races. He's created the languages and the cultures. And that ain't never going to change. The heart of man is never going to change. But oh no, you see, man hates God. Man wants nothing to do with God. And because man hates God, there's no fear of God, as we read in Romans chapter 3. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Yeah, that's you if you're not saved today. They're all gone out of the way. That's right. We're all gone out of the way. We all went to the football game. We all went to see the Florida Gators, didn't we? We all went to see the Green Bay Packers. We're just completely given up to the sports fanaticism. Where we can't even add two and two anymore. We're all gone out of the way. Just do what you want to do. What's right for right is you for you. What's good for you is good for you. You've got to find your own way. No, there's only one way. And that's Christ. 
They're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. That includes you, Pope Francis I. That includes you, Jesuit General Adolfo Nicholas, and your entire Jesuit order. There's none of you sinners, not one of you, that does any good. None of you. In fact, all you do is evil. You're the rulers of evil. You're Satan's right-hand men in the implementation of his mystery of iniquity. What a joke and a farce to think that you can have forgiveness of sins going to confession. The apostle goes on by the Spirit of God. Their throat is an open sepulcher. That's a grave. Ever seen an open grave with a dead body in it? With their tongues, they've used deceit. They're liars and deceivers. They say one thing and do another. The entire judiciary of the American empire is nothing but one big deceit. And if you don't believe me, just try going to court someday as a U.S. citizen or as an enemy belligerent and see how those judges treat you, boy. Do you realize they are allowed to deceive you and lie to you? Do you know that? Oh, but we're supposed to respect them in the high places. Oh, that's Judge So-and-so. Judge So-and-so of the court there. He's coming to the restaurant. He ought to be hiding in shame. The poison of asps is under their lips. The poison of scorpions, of asps, is under their lips. They're full of poison and they sting whenever they talk. Their throat is a, uh, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. They just love to curse and be, be profane. They love it. My father was that way. My brother and I oftentimes laugh about it. She's not really not laughable, but I was the guy that when dad would start to swear, I'd start to laugh. <laughs> then he'd swear at me for laughing. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. They're bitter. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. You know why? Because they don't know the great prince of peace. So how can a man who doesn't know the prince of peace have any peace? And he then concludes in verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's the problem. They not only hate God, they're not afraid of Him. So because they're not afraid of God, they think they can do anything and get away with it. Amen, brother? They think they can get, they do anything. That's why these people in politics lie to you from the moment they open their mouth to the moment they close it. I was watching Donald Trump, how measured he is in his speaking. Is there not a man that will completely divulge his heart without being afraid of being called a racist or a bigot or a sexist or whatever? How about just appealing on the basis of the truth? You know why there aren't any men like that in the political arena? Because you can only count on a few hands preachers that are like that. Because those preachers are Mr. Persona Non Grata. We're not going to invite them to the ministerial association to partake with us in a day of prayer for other people because they hate us. It's like Micaiah was hated by the king. Every time he prophesies, he prophesies against me. Don't bring him out here. Jehoshaphat says, bring him up. We want to know if we should go up against these enemies. Micaiah says, the Lord's going to smite your army, and if he doesn't, he's not spoken, of my, well, spoken by me. The prophet of God, the man of God, is not afraid to confront the political leaders of his day. Those are the Puritan preachers that gave us political liberty. Witherspoon and others preaching against the sin of King George III and the sin of the governors of the colonies refusing to allow the colonists to do away with the slave trade. Jefferson said they would not allow us to do away with it, but rather they're bringing all the blacks over here to one day unite them to kill us all. And that was in a provision that was going to be in the Declaration of Independence, but Georgia and one other state said, no, we can't have that right now. I tell you, the preachers in those days, like the father of Samuel Morris, Jedediah Morris, Jedediah Morris came out and said, Jefferson's an Illuminatus. That's what he said. 
Where's the preacher today that says, Bill Clinton's Illuminatus, Hillary Clinton's an Eastern star, Donald Trump's the 33rd degree, we can't vote for any of them! Where's that preacher? Back in a few moments on the fear of God. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. Well, there John Phelps back with the broadcast today concerning no fear of God by men and thus men hating God. Men hating God. I have a little background noise here, so I'm going to get rid of it. I'll be back in just a second. Okay. About men hating God. So let's go on. Enjoy this topic today. For those of you who shoot straight, you know it's the truth. But for those of you liars and deceivers, you don't want to hear about your wickedness, about your hatred for God, and about your hatred for the Son of God, and therefore there'd be having no fear of God. But that's why I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Because I was the same way once. The Bible goes on to say, What happens when a man has no fear of God? And here's a classic example that's oftentimes overlooked. Luke, chapter 23, verse 40. Luke 23, verse 40. Christ is on the cross. And between him are two criminals. The Bible calls malefactors. And let's see what happens. For the one who hates God and the one who fears God. We read in Luke chapter 23, verse 34 and following. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them, deriding him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And if he said he was, he said he was the Christ chosen of God because he rode into Jerusalem on a little donkey, just as Zechariah the prophet said he would. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He's lowly, riding upon an ass, upon the colt, the folding full of an ass, whose, verse 10, whose rule shall be from the river to the ends of the earth. That's Davidic kingdom under Messiah to rule the world from Jerusalem. So, He doesn't fulfill that part, but he fulfills verse 9, so he rides in as Messiah. And then they say, well, if he's the Christ, if he's Messiah, let him save himself. The chosen, the elect of God, the stone that the builders have rejected, the same has become the head of the corner, referring to Psalm 118. If he's this elect stone, the precious stone, he who believeth on him shall not be ashamed. If he's really the one, let him come down. And notice who's saying this. Notice who's saying this, the religious leaders of the day, which teaches us something, that the vast majority of religious leaders of our day hate God. They hate him. Because if they didn't hate him, they would tell the truth about him and what he likes and what he doesn't like. And what he's done and what he's doing and what he's going to do. They would say, say these things. But oh, no, no, no. The religious leaders in general hate God because they hate his son. Verse 36, and the soldiers also mocked him. Why? As go the religious leaders, so go the soldiers. That's why they don't give us the Bible in basic training anymore. They, when I was in basic training back in 1910, did you get that? When I was in basic training back in 1972, they gave us all Gideon Bibles. Little Gideon Blue New Testaments, I still remember it. 
Not anymore, because we have the separation of church and state here now, and what we really mean is we hate God, and since we, the political leaders hate God, the religious leaders hate God, well, they want their army to hate God too, so they can get defeated in a battle. Because there was a time when our American military was led by godly men who feared God, they read the Bible, and God gave them victory. Like that great general in the Far East, when he had his special aircraft, he had what would they call them? Uh, oh, I forget the name of them. Uh, he was a Presbyterian, and he had his flying tigers. Flying tigers. Uh, and forget the name of that general there in the Far East, but he feared God, and those flying tigers defeated those Japanese everywhere they flew. You know why? Because they prayed. Why, we can't have a praying general. We can't have a praying army. They might win, and that would frustrate the desires of the Jesuits. So the soldiers are mocking him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. What a stone-hard-hearted thing to do, to offer any man dying such a horrible death as crucifixion. Instead of giving him a little water, we'll give him vinegar. Yeah, vinegar. Yeah. You ever drank straight vinegar? My wife's uh, grandfather used to have an apple orchard, and he would make vinegar. And he made the most potent apple cider vinegar I've ever tasted. And to think anybody would drink one swing of, swing of that is a dis horrible thought. Give him vinegar. Shows how much we hate him. Then, we'll go on. And saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. If you're so tough, if you're the Messiah that's supposed to crush the nations, if you're supposed to smash them with a rod of iron, as Isaiah says you will, then come on down, boy. Take us on. Verse 38. And a superscription was also written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. So it's in all three major languages. The Greek is the cultural language of the day. The Greek language really conquered the Roman Empire. The language of Rome was Greek. The language of the religion, of the, of the Latin religion of Rome was Latin. And the language of Hebrew, of the Hebrew Jewish Israelites, was there in Hebrew. So it appeals to everyone. The culture, religion, and the Jews. This is the king of the Jews. And the religious leaders hated Christ so much, they said to Pilate, don't write that above his head. Say that he said I was king of the Jews. Pilate says, I've written what I've written. Nobody hates Christ more than religious leaders. The priests hate him. The Pope hates him. All the Muslim inmates hate him. All the high Jewish leaders hate him. All the Hindi leaders hate him. The Buddhist leaders hate him. There's nobody who hates the true Son of God, Son of Man, any more than the religious leaders of these diabolical religious denominations. And that includes the majority of Protestants and Baptists now because they're all fraught with the disgusting, diabolical secret society of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, which all hates God. Verse 39. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. And so now it goes down to the lowest man on the totem pole. First the religious leaders, then the political leaders, and then the, the army, and then finally the common guy who's a criminal. He's going to blaspheme God too. Everybody's doing it. Don't want to be left out. Got to have universal equality and communism and the blasphemy of God. That's why the religion of communism is atheism. Another blasphemy. If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But now, let's read about the one who fears God. But the other, answering, rebuked him. You see, the man who fears God rebukes the God-hater. 
But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing abyss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So here this man, suffering for his sins and crimes, he fears God. And he believes on Christ. He believes the message of Christ. He believed the message of John the Baptist. John said, an axe is laid at the root of the tree. He's going to chop it down. And all the chaff's going to go into the wind, and the barns and the, and the grain's going to be brought into the barn of the millennial kingdom. It was a message of judgment, man. Judgment's coming. Time to repent, nation of Israel. And it's the same message today. Judgment is coming, sir, for you. Not only in your death when you descend into hell and wait for the great white throne judgment, but when the second coming of Christ, judgment is coming. But this man feared God, and he did the right thing. So Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Wasn't even baptized, was he? Nope. Because he feared God. And the grand finale of the fear of God leads to the second coming of Christ, as we read in Revelation 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that she may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which, is, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That's what's coming. And my question to you, my friend, is, are you headed for the judgment of God? Are you headed for the vengeance of God? Are you going to stand before his bar at the great white throne when he gives you your personal judgment, which is an inquest, and he will say to his church, someone ministering him to there, bring forth for me the scroll of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Bring them both. And as he gives an accounting of everything they've ever done, everything they've ever said, they're going to be in stark terror. Because there's no hiding anything from the Son of God. He's omniscient. He knows it all. And further, it's all written down so you can have a see a copy. And after that horrible, terrible judgment, where they'll both be weeping and wailing, <laughs> Oh, 
and he's reading off the, all the terrible deeds that they did. How you killed those marine, those you know, those uh, Navy SEALs of Benghazi. How you betrayed your own country. How you were working with the sheiks in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, Donald, while you were busy conspiring against the, middle, middle, the American people. All that's going to be brought out. And as you're shuddering and quaking, in utter fear of what's going to be done to you, he will conclude by saying, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, Hillary and Donald. Ye that work iniquity with the horrible, terrible last words. I never knew you. I never knew you. It doesn't have to end there. You can know him today. The Bible is called all men everywhere to repent. The Lord said in Acts 17, 30. These times God's winked at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent, to turn from our idols and our dead works. Going in and out, after going under our own ways for all these years, he's calling us to truly repent, to turn from that, and to believe this wonderful, forgiving grace of God, that he can forget all, forgive all of our debts, save us by his grace upon truly believing that his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again, according to the scriptures. And the Bible concludes in John chapter 1, And as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's all there is, my friend. Why? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. We have nothing to boast. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Will that be your song today? It's my prayer that it shall be. Time to believe the gospel, my friend. Time to stop hating God. And time to stop having no fear of God. For apart from the Son of God, we're all doomed. Will you receive him today? Will you have your sins forgiven today? I trust that you shall. Go to my website, vaticanassassins.org, 247worldradio.com. Purchase my book, Vatican Assassins. I have the gospel all through it, as well as exposure of the Jesuits. Purchase the reference library. Purchase Clear and Present Evil. Please support this ministry because I do my best to be as offensive as possible so that when giving the remedy, it's crystal clear. Jesus Christ and his glorious gospel of the Jews. Back in a moment. Prayer in the new. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. Okay, Brother John Fellows back again. Second hour. We're going to read from our 50 years in Church of Rome. Charles Chinnicky, as we're coming up to our last chapters, and uh, we shall be reading in the chapter that we were in, and that chapter was 62, I believe, 61. We read, continuing. Reread. He says, In all those murders, you will find that the murderers selected and trained by the Jesuits were of the most exalted Roman Catholic piety. 
living in the company of priests, going to confess very often, receiving the communion the day before, if not the very day of the murder. You will see in all those horrible deeds of hell prepared behind the dark walls of that holy inquisition that the assassins were considering themselves as the chosen instruments of God to save the nation by striking its tyrant, and they firmly believed that there was no sin in killing the enemy of the people, of the Holy Church, and of the infallible Pope. Compare the last hours of the Jesuit Ravalyak, the assassin of Henry IV, who absolutely refuses to repent, although suffering the most horrible tortures on the rack with Booth, whose suffering also the most horrible tortures from his broken leg, writes in his daily memorandum the very day before his death, quote, I can never repent, though we hated to kill. Our country owed all our troubles to him, Lincoln, and God simply made me the instrument of his punishment, unquote. Trial of Surat, volume 1, page 310. Yes, Compare the bloody deeds of those two assassins, and you will see that they had been trained in the same school. They had been taught by the same teachers. Evidently, the Jesuit Revaliac, calling, on, calling all the saints of heaven to his help at his last hour, and Booth pressing the medal of the Virgin Mary on his breast when falling mortally wounded. Trial of Surat, page 310, I believe. Both came from the same Jesuit mold. Who has lost his common sense enough to suppose that it was Jeff Davis, <clears throat> pardon me, who had filled the mind and the heart of Booth that, that with the religious and so exalted fanaticism? Surely Jeff Davis could have promised the money to reward the assassins and nerve their arms by the hope of becoming rich. The testimonies on that account says that one million dollars had been asked from him Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, page 51 and 52. The arch rebel could, have, could give the money, but the Jesuits alone could select the assassins, train them, and show them a crown of glory in heaven. If they would kill the author of the bloodshed, the famous renegade and apostate, the enemy of the Pope and of the Church, Lincoln. Who does not see the lessons given by the Jesuits to Booth in their daily intercourse in Mary Surratt's house when he reads those lines written by Booth a few hours before the death, quote, his death, quote, I can never repent. God made me the instrument of his punishment, unquote. Compare these words with the doctrines and principles taught by the councils, the decrees of the Pope, and the laws of the Holy Inquisition, as you find them in chapter 55 of this volume. And you will find that the sentiments and belief of Booth flow from those principles as the river flows from its source. And that pious Miss Surratt, who, the very next day after the murder of Lincoln, said, without being rebuked, in the presence of several other witnesses, quote, the death of Abraham Lincoln is no more than the death of any nigger in the army, unquote. Where did she get that maxim, if not from her church? Had not that church recently proclaimed through her highest legal and civil authority the devoted Roman Catholic Judge Taney in his Dred Scott decision that Negroes have no right which the white is bound to respect. By bringing the president on a level with the lowest nigger, Rome was saying that she had no right even to his life. And for this was the maxim of the rebel priests who everywhere had made themselves the echoes of the sentence of their distinguished co-religious Taney. It was from the very lips of the priests who were constantly coming in and going out of their home that those young ladies had learned those antisocial and anti-Christian doctrines. Read in the testimony concerning Mrs. Mary E. Surratt, pages 122 to 123, how the Jesuits had perfectly drilled her in the art of perjuring herself, kind of like Hillary Clinton with Benghazi. In the very moment, when the government officer orders her to prepare herself with her daughter to follow him as prisoners, at about 10 p.m., Payne, P-A-Y-N-E, the would-be murderer of Seward, knocks at the door and wants to see Mrs. Surratt. But instead of having Mrs. Surratt to open the door, he finds himself confronted face-to-face -face with the government detective, Major Smith, who swears, quote, 
I questioned him in regard to his occupation and what business he had at the house at this late hour of the night. He stated that he was a laborer and had come to dig a gutter at the request of Miss Surratt. I went to the parlor door and said, Miss Surratt, will you step here a minute? She came out and I asked her, do you know this man and did you hire him to come and dig a gutter for you? She answered, raising her right hand, Before God, sir, I do not know this man. I have never seen him, and I did not hire him to dig a gutter for me. Unquote. Assassination of Lincoln, page 122. But it was proved after by several unimpeachable witnesses that she knew very well that Payne was a personal friend of her son, who many times had come to her house in company of his friend and pet, Booth. She had received the communion just two or three days before that public perjury. Just a moment after making it, the officer ordered her to step out into the carriage. Before doing it, she asked permission to kneel down and pray, which was granted. Page 123. Got to look religious here now. I ask it from any man of common sense. Could Jeff Davis have imparted such a religious calm and self-possession to that woman when her hands were just reddened with the blood of the president and she was on her way to trial? No, such sang Freud, such calm in that soul, in such a terrible and solemn hour could only come from the teachings of those Jesuits who, for more than six months, were in her house, showing her a crown of eternal glory if she would help to kill the monster apostate, Lincoln, the only cause of that horrible civil war. There is not the least doubt that the priests had perfectly succeeded in persuading Mary Surratt and Booth that the killing of Lincoln was a most holy and deserving work for which God had eternal reward in store. There is a fact to which the American people have not yet given a sufficient attention. It is that, without a single exception, the conspirators were Roman Catholics. The learned and great patriot, General Baker, in his admirable report, struck the bewild- struck and bewildered by that strange, mysterious, and portentous fact, said, quote, I mention as an exceptional and remarkable fact that every conspirator in custody is, by education, a Catholic, unquote. But those words, which, if well understood by the United States, would have thrown so much light on the true causes of their untold and unspeakable disasters, fell as if on the ears of deaf men. Very few, if any, paid attention to them. As General Baker says, all the conspirators were attending Catholic church services and were educated Roman Catholics. It is true that some of them, as Azeroth, Payne, and Harold, asked for Protestant ministers when they were to be hung. But they had been considered, till then, as converts to Romanism. At page 436 of The Trial of John Surratt, Lewis Welchman tells us that he was going to St. Aloysian's church with Azeroth and that it was there that he introduced him to Mr. Brothy, another Roman Catholic. It is, well authentic, it is a well-authenticated fact that Booth and Welchman, who were themselves Protestant perverts to Romanism, had proselytized a good number of semi-Protestants and infidels who, either from conviction or from hope of the fortunes promised to the successful murderers, were themselves very zealous for the Church of Rome. Pain, Asteros, and Herald were among those proselytes. But when those murderers were to appear before the country and receive the just punishment of their crime, the Jesuits were too shrewd to ignore that if they were all coming on the scaffold as Roman Catholics and accompanied by their father confessors, it would at once open the eyes of the American people and clearly show that this was a Roman Catholic plot. They persuaded three of their proselytes to avail themselves of the theological principles of the Church of Rome, that a man is allowed to conceal his religion, nay, that he, may be, that he may say that he is an heretic, a Protestant, though he is a Roman Catholic, when it is for his own interest or the best interest of this church to conceal the truth and deceive the people. Here is the doctrine of Rome on that subject. Quote, he gives it in Latin, and then he translates it. In Lucuri, the Theologica, Book 2, 
chapter 3, page 6. This is Alphonse Lacoury, a notable Jesuit coadjutor. Quote, It is often more to the glory of God and the good of our neighbor to conceal our religious faith as when we live among heretics. We can more easily do them good in that way. Or if by declaring our religion we cause some disturbances or deaths or even the wrath of the tyrant. Unquote. It is evident that the Jesuits had never had better reasons to suspect that the declaration of their religion would damage them and excite the wrath of their tyrant, viz. the American people. You see how they hated us? How they hated the American people and destroyed our sovereignty on March 9th, 1933 with FDR and his proclamation 2040? Going on. Lloyd's, in whose house Miss, Mrs. Surratt concealed the carbon which Booth wanted for protection, when just after the murder he was to flee towards the southern states, was a firm Roman Catholic. Dr. Nudd, actually Mudd, at whose place Booth stopped to have his broken leg dressed, was a Roman Catholic, and so was Garrett, Garrett in whose barn Booth was caught and killed. Of course, we know that wasn't so, but that's another broadcast. Why so? Because as Jeff Davis was the only man to pay $1 million to those who would kill Abraham Lincoln, the Jesuits were the only men to select the murderers and prepare everything to protect them after their diabolical plot, and such murderers could not be found except among their blind and fanatical slaves. The great, the fatal mistake of the American government in the prosecution of the assassins of Abraham Lincoln was to constantly keep out of sight the religious element of that terrible drama. Nothing could have been more easy than to find out the complicity of the priests who were not only coming every week and every day, but who were even living in that den of murderers. But this was carefully avoided from the beginning to the end by the tr of the trial. When not long after the execution of the murderers, I went incognito to Washington to begin my investigation about its real and true authors, I was not a little surprised to see that not a single one of the government men to whom I addressed myself would consent to have any talk with me on that matter, except after I had given my word of honor that I would never mention their names in connection with the plot with the result of my investigation. I saw with a profound distress that the influence of Rome was almost supreme in Washington. This is 1865, okay? I could not find a single statesman who would dare to face that nefarious influence and fight it down, except General Baker. Kind of like today. Nobody in Washington resists the Jesuits. Amen? Not one. Several of the government men in whom I had more confidence told me, quote, we had not the least doubt that the Jesuits were at the bottom of that great iniquity. We even feared sometimes that this would come out so clearly before the military tribunal that there would be no possibility of keeping it out of the public sight. This was not through cowardice, as you think, but through a wisdom which you ought to approve if you cannot admire it. We had been in days of peace, had we been in days of peace, we know that with a little more pressure on the witnesses, many priests would have been compromised. For Mrs. Surratt's house was their common rendezvous. It is more than probable that several of them might have been hung. But the Civil War was hardly over. The Confederacy, though broken down, was still living in millions of hearts. Murderers and formidable elements of discord were still seen everywhere to which the hanging or exiling of those priests would have given a new life. Riots after riots would have accomp accompanied and followed their execution. We thought we had had enough of blood, fires, devastations, and bad feelings. We were all longing after days of peace. The country was in need of them. We concluded that the best interest of humanity was to punish only those who were publicly and visibly guilty that the verdict might receive the approbation of all without creating any new bad feelings. Allow us also to tell you that this policy was that of our late president. For you know it well, there was nothing which that great and good man feared so much as to arm the Protestants against the Catholics 
and the Catholics against the Protestants, unquote. Well, I, as an aside, I say that if that's the result of exposing the Jesuit murder of Abraham Lincoln, then let it come. If that's going to be the result of exposing the Jesuit murder of our first Roman Catholic president, which I devoted many years to in the writing of my book, well then, let it come. Let the truth be told, though the heavens fall, though it results in civil war, though it results in everything, nonetheless, we are obliged to tell the truth, and would to God that he would intervene on our behalf. Maybe God might send a great awakening to the Roman Catholics. And they become the great enemies of the Roman papacy, as what took place during the Protestant Reformation. Well, many of those Roman Catholics were saved and began to resist the papacy. Continuing on. But if anyone has still any doubts of the complicity of the Jesuits in the murder of Abraham Lincoln, let them give a moment of attention to the following facts, and their doubts will be forever removed. It is only from the very Jesuit accomplices' lips that I take my sworn testimonies. It is evident that a very elaborate plan of escape had been prepared by the priests of Rome to save the lives of the assassins and the conspirators. It would be too long to follow all the murders when, Cain-like, they were fleeing in every direction to escape the vengeance of God and man. Let us fix our eyes on John Surratt, who was in Washington on the 14th of April, helping Booth in the perpetration of the assassination. Who will take care of him? Who will protect and conceal him? Who will press him on their bosoms, put their mantles on his shoulders, to conceal from him the just vengeance of the human and divine laws. The priest, Charles Boucher, Trial of John Surratt, Volume 2, page 904 to 912, swears that only a few days after the murder, John Surratt was sent to him by Father Lapierre of Montreal, that he kept him concealed in his parsonage of St. Libuor from the end of April to the end of July. Then he took him back secretly to Father Lapierre, who kept him secreted in his own father's house, under the very shadow of the Montreal Bishop's Palace. He swears, page 905 to 914, that Father Lapierre visited him, Surratt, often, when secreted at St. Lapierre, and that he, Father Boucher, visited him at least twice a week, from the end of July to September, when concealed in Father Lapierre's house in Montreal. That same Father Charles Boucher swears that he accompanied John Surratt in a carriage in the company of Father Lapierre to the steamer, quote, Montreal, unquote, when starting for Quebec. The Father Lapierre kept him, John Surratt, under lock during the voyage from Montreal to Quebec, and that he accompanied him, disguised from the Montreal steamer, to the ocean steamer, quote, Peruvian, unquote. Trial of John Surratt, page 910. The doctor of the steamer, quote, Peruvian, unquote, L.I.A. McMillan swears, volume 1, page 460, that Father Lapierre introduced him to John Surratt under the false name of McCarthy, whom he was keeping locked in his stateroom and whom he conducted disguised to the ocean steamer, quote, Peruvian, unquote, and with whom he remained till he left Quebec for Europe the 15th of September, 1865. But who is that Father Lapierre who takes such a tender, I dare say, a paternal care of Surratt? It is not less a personage than the canon of Bishop Bourget of Montreal. He is the confidential man of the bishop. He lives with the bishop, eats at his table, assists him with his counsel, and has to receive his advice to, to, in every step of life. According to the laws of Rome, the canons are to the bishop what the arms are to the body. And by the way, there was a canon named August Patin, who was a canon to the Archbishop of Munich, Michael Cardinal von Fallhaber, and this canon who up at the time of the breaking out of World War II resigned as a Catholic priest, became an SS officer, 
and worked at SS headquarters later in Berlin. You can find this in a book called The Order of the Death's Head by Heinz Honey on about page 60 or thereabouts. Continuing on. Now I ask, is it not evident that the bishops and the priests of Washington have trusted this murderer to the tender care of the bishops and priests of Montreal, that they might conceal, feed, and protect him for nearly six months under the very shadow of the bishop's palace? Would they have done that if they were not his accomplices? Why did they so continually remain with him day and night if they were not in fear that he might compromise them by an indiscreet word? Why do we see those priests, I ought to say those two ambassadors, and appointed representatives of the Pope, alone in the carriage which takes that great culprit from his house of concealment to the steamer. Why do they keep him there, under lock, till they transfer him, under a disguised name, to the oceanic steamer, the, quote, Peruvian, unquote, on the 15th of July, 1865? Why such tender sympathies for that stranger? Why go through such trouble and expense for that young American among the bishops and priests of Canada? There is only one answer. He was one of their tools, one of their selected men, to strike the great republic of equality and liberty to the heart. For more than six months before the murder, the priest has lodged, eaten, conversed, slept with him under the same roof in Washington. They had trained him to his deed of blood by promising him protection on earth and a crown of glory in heaven if he would be the true, if he would only be true to their designs to the end. And he had been true to the end. Now the great crime is accomplished. Lincoln is murdered. Jeff Davis, the dear son of the Pope, is avenged. The great republic has been struck to the heart. The soldiers of liberty all over the world are weeping over the dead form of the one who had led them to victory. A cry of desolation goes from earth to heaven. It seems as if we heard the death knell of the cause of freedom, equality, and fraternity among men. It was many centuries since the implacable enemies of the rights and liberties of men had struck such a giant foe. Their joy was as great as their victory complete. But do you see that man fleeing from Washington toward the north? He has the mark of Cain on his forehead. His hands are reddened with blood. He is pale and trembling, for he knows it. A whole outraged nation is after him for her just vengeance. He hears the thundering voice of God, quote, Where is thy brother? Unquote. Where will he find a refuge? Where, outside of hell, will he meet friends to shelter and save him from the just vengeance of God and men? Oh, he has sure refuge in the arms of that church, which for more than a thousand years is crying, quote, Death to all heretics! Death to all the soldiers of liberty! Unquote. He has devoted friends among the very men who, after having prepared the massacre of Admiral Caligny, who was a French Huguenot Calvinistic Protestant, and his 75,000 Protestant countrymen, rang the bells of Rome to express their joy when they heard that at last the king of France had slaughtered them all. What the Dometicis did, Charles the Ninth. But where will those bishops and priests of Canada send John Surratt when they find it impossible to conceal him any longer from the thousands of detectives, <coughs> pardon me, from the thousands of detectives of the United States who are ransacking Canada to find out his retreat? Who will conceal, feed, lodge, and protect him after the priests of Canada pressed his hand for the last time on board of the, quote, Peruvian, unquote, the 15th of September, 1865? Who can have any doubt about that? Who can suppose that anyone <clears throat> but the Pope himself and his Jesuits will protect the murderer of Abraham Lincoln in Europe? If you want to see him after he has crossed the ocean, go to Vitry at the door of Rome, and there you will find him enrolled under the banners of the Pope in the ninth company of his Zouaves under the false name of Watson. Trial of John Surratt, Volume 1, page 492. 
Of course, the Pope was forced to withdraw his protection over him after the government of the United States had found him there, and he was brought back to Washington to be tried. That's right, because you see, the government then at the time threatened to confiscate every piece of Roman Catholic property in America if Surratt was not turned over in 1867. Pardon me. But on his arrival as a prisoner in the United States, his Jesuit father confessor, confessor whispered in his ear, quote, Fear not, you will not be condemned. Through the influence of a high Roman Catholic lady, two or three of the jurymen will be Roman Catholics, and you will be safe, unquote. Those who have read the two volumes of the trial of John Surratt know that never more evident proofs of guilt were brought against a murderer than in that case. But the Roman Catholic jurymen had read the theology of St. Thomas, a book which the Pope had ordered to be taught in every college, academy, and university of Rome. They had learned that it is the duty of the Roman Catholics to exterminate all heretics. St. Thomas's Theology, Volume 4, page 90. We shall be back in a moment. You're listening to 24-7 World Radio. The way St. Thomas Theology was the Summa Theologica of Thomas Aquinas, a most diabolical work that will be banned in my country of probaptical. Continuing, they had read the decree of the councils of Constance that no faith was to be kept with heretics. Pardon me. They had read in the Council of Lateran that the Catholics who arm themselves for the extermination of heretics have all their sins forgiven and receive the same blessings as those who go and fight for the rescue of the Holy Land. That is to take it from the Muslims. <clears throat> those jur- journeymen, those jurymen, were told by their father confessors that the Most Holy Father, Pope Gregory the Seventh, had solemnly and infallibly declared that quote the killing of a heretic was no murder, jury canonical. After such teachings, how could the Roman Catholic jurymen find John Surratt guilty of murder for killing the heretic Lincoln? The jury having disagreed, no verdict could be given. That's called a hung jury. Okay? The government was forced to let the murderer go unpunished. But when the, the unreconcilable enemies of all the rights and liberties of men were congratulating themselves on their successful efforts to save the life of John Surratt, the God of heaven was stamping again on their faces the mark of murder in such a way that all eyes will see it. Quote, murder will out, unquote, is a truth repeated by all nations from the beginning of the world. It is the knowledge of that truth which has sustained me in my long and difficult researches of the true authors of the assassination of Lincoln and which enables me today to present to the world a fact which seems almost miraculous to show the complicity of the priests of Rome in the murder of the martyred president. Some time ago, I providentially met the Reverend Mr. F.A. Conwell at Chicago. Having known that I was in search of facts about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, he told me he knew one of those facts, which might perhaps throw some light on the subject of my researches. Quote, The very day of the murder, unquote, he said, quote, He was in the Roman Catholic village of St. Joseph, Minnesota State, when about six o'clock in the afternoon, he was told by a Roman Catholic of the place, who was a purveyor of a great number of priests who lived in that town, where they have a monastery, that the state secretary Seward and the President Lincoln had just been killed. This was told me, he said, in the presence of a most respectable gentleman called Bennett, who is not less puzzled than me. As there were no railroad lines nearer than 40 miles, no telegraph offices nearer than 80 miles from that place, 
We could not see how such news was spread in that town. The next day, the 15th of April, I was at St. Cloud, a town about 12 miles distance, where there are neither railroad nor telegraph. I said to several people that I had been told in the priestly village of St. Joseph by a Roman Catholic that Abraham and the secretary steward, Seward, had been assassinated. They answered me that they had heard nothing about it. But the next Sabbath, the 16th of April, when going to the church of St. Cloud to preach, a friend gave me a copy of a telegram sent to him on the Saturday, reporting that Abraham Lincoln and Secretary Seward had been assassinated the very day before, which was Friday, the 14th, at 10 p.m. But how could the Roman Catholic purveyor of the priests of St. Joseph have told me the same thing before several witnesses just four hours before its occurrence? I spoke of that strange thing to many the same day, and the very next day I wrote to the St. Paul Press, unquote, under the heading of, quote, a strange coincidence, unquote. Sometime later, the editor of, quote, the St. Paul Pioneer, unquote, having denied what I had written on that subject, I addressed him the following note, which he had printed and which I have kept. Here it is. You may keep it as an infallible proof of my veracity, unquote. Now, this gentleman continues to give this note to Charles Chinnicky. Quote, to the editor of the St. Paul Pioneer, you assume the non-truth of a short paragraph addressed by me to the St. Paul Press, namely, quote, a strange coincidence. At 6.30 p.m. Friday, last April 14th, I was told as an item of news eight miles west of this place that Lincoln and Seward had been assassinated. This was three hours after I had heard the news. St. Cloud, 17th of April, 1865. The integrity of history requires that the above coincidence be established. And if anyone calls it in question, then proofs more ample than reared their sanguinary shadows, shadows, sanguinary means bloody, then proofs more ample then reared their sanguinary shadows to comfort a traitor can now be given. Respectfully, F.A. Conwell, unquote. I asked that gentleman if he would be kind enough to give me the fact under oath that I might make use of it in the report I intended to publish about the assassination of Lincoln. And he kindly granted my request in the following form. Here's an affidavit. State of Illinois, Cook County, Sworn and sworn and stated. Reverend F.A. Conwell, being sworn, deposes and says that he is 71 years old, that he is a resident of North Evanston in Cook County, state of Illinois, that he has been in the ministry for 56 years and is now one of the chaplains of the, quote, Siemens Bethel Home, unquote, in Chicago, that he was chaplain of the 1st Minnesota Regiment in the War of the Rebellion that on the 14th day of April, A.D. 1865, he was in St. Joseph, Minnesota, and reached there as early as 6 o'clock in the evening in company with Mr. Bennett, who then and now is a resident of St. Cloud, Minnesota. That on that day, there was no telegraph nearer than Minneapolis, about 80 miles from St. Joseph, and there was no railroad communication nearer than Avoca, Minnesota, about 40 miles distance, distant. That when he reached St. Joseph on the 14th day of April, 1865, one Mr. Lindman, who then kept the hotel of St. Joseph, told Affiant that President Lincoln and Secretary Seward were assassinated, that it was not later than half past six o'clock on Friday, April 14th, 1865, when Mr. Lindman told me this. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Bennett came in the hotel, and I told him that Mr. Lineman said the President Lincoln and Secretary Seward were assassinated. And then the same Mr. Lineman reported the same conversation to Mr. Bennett in my presence. That during that time, Mr. Lineman told me that he had had the charge of the friary or college for young men under the priests who were studying for the priesthood at St. Joseph that there was a large multitude of this kind at St. Joseph at this time. 
Afian says that on Saturday morning, April 15th, 1865, he went to St. Cloud, a distance of about 10 miles, and reached there about 8 o'clock in the morning, that there was no railroad nor telegraph communication to St. Cloud. When he arrived at St. Cloud, he told Mr. Haworth, the hotel keeper, that he had been told that President Lincoln and Secretary Seward had been assassinated and asked if it were true. He further told Henry Clay, wait, Charles Gilman, who was afterwards Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota, and Reverend Mr. Tice, the same thing, and inquired of them if they had any such views, and they replied that they had not heard anything of the kind. Affian says that on Sunday morning, April 16, 1865, he preached in St. Cloud, and on the way to the church, a copy of a telegram was handed him, stating that the president and secretary were assassinated Friday evening at about 9 o'clock. And by the way, this was Good Friday. This telegram had been brought to St. Cloud by Mr. Gort- Gorton, who had reached St. Cloud by stage, and this was the first intelligence that had reached St. Cloud on the, of the event. Affian further says that on Monday morning, April 17, 1865, he furnished the, quote, press, unquote, a paper of St. Paul, a statement that three hours before the event took place, he had been informed at St. Joseph, Minnesota, that the president had been assassinated, and this was published in the, quote, press, unquote. Francis Asbury Conwell. Subscribed and sworn to by French Francis A. Conwell before me, a notary public of Kankakee County, Illinois, at Chicago, Cook County, the sixth day of September, 1883. Stephen R. Moore, notary, notary public. Though this document was very important and precious to me, I felt that it would be much more valuable if it could be corroborated by the testimonies of Messrs. Bennett and Linneman themselves, and I immediately sent a magistrate to find out if they were still living and if they remembered the facts of the sworn declaration of Reverend Mr. Conwell. By the good providence of God, both of these gentlemen were found living and both gave the following testimonies. Quote, <clears throat> State of Minnesota, Stearns County, City of St. Cloud. Horace B. Bennett, being sworn, deposes and says, that he is aged 64 years, that he is a resident of St. Cloud, Minnesota, and he has resided in this county since 1856, that he is acquainted with the Reverend F.A. Conwell, who was chaplain of the 1st Minnesota Regiment in the War of the Rebellion, that on the 14th of April, 1865, he was in St. Joseph, Minnesota, in company with Mr. Francis A. Conwell, that they reached St. Joseph about sundown of said April 14th, that there was no railroad or telegraph communication with St. Joseph at that time, nor nearer than Avoca, about 40 miles distant, that Affian, on reaching the hotel kept by Mr. Lineman, went to the barn while Reverend F. Conwell entered the hotel, and shortly afterward, Affian had returned to the hotel. Mr. Conwell told him that Mr. Lineman had reported to him the assassination of President Lincoln, that Lineman was present and substantiated the statement. On that Saturday morning, April 15th, Affian and Reverend Conwell came to St. Cloud and reported that they had been told at St. Joseph about the assassination of President Lincoln, that no one at St. Cloud had heard of the event at this time, <clears throat> pardon me, and that the first news of the event which reached St. Cloud was on Sunday evening, April 16th, when the news was brought by Leander Gorton, who had just come up from Avoca, Minnesota, that they spoke to several persons of St. Cloud concerning the matter when they reached there on Sunday morning, but Affian does not know, <coughs> pardon me, but Affian does not now remember who those different persons were, and further Affian says not. Horace P. Bennett, sworn before me and subscribed in my presence this 18th of October, 8 AD 1883. Andrew C. Robertson, Notary Public. <clears throat> Mr. Lineman, having refused to swear on his written declaration, which I have in my possession, 
I take only from it what, ref what refers to the principal fact, viz., that three or four hours before Lincoln was assassinated at Washington, the 14th of April, 1865, the fact was told as already accomplished in the priestly village of St. Joseph, Minnesota. Quote, he, Linneman, remembers the time that Messrs. Conwell and Bennett came to this place, St. Joseph, Minnesota, on Friday evening before the president was killed, and he asked them if they had heard he was dead. And they replied they had not. He heard this rumor in his store from people who came in and out, but he cannot remember from whom. October 20th, 1883, J.H. Linneman. <clears throat> Pardon me. I present here to the world a fact of the greatest gravity. And that fact is so well authenticated that it cannot allow even the possibility of a doubt. Three or four hours before Lincoln was murdered in Washington, the 14th of April, 1865, the mur that murder was not only known by someone, but it was circulated and talked of in the streets and in the houses of the priestly and Romish town of St. Joseph, Minnesota. The fact is undeniable. The testimonies are unchallengeable, and there were no, and there were no railroad nor any telegraph communication nearer than 40 or 80 miles from the nearest station to St. Joseph. Naturally, everyone asked, how could such news spread? Where is the source of such a rumor? Mr. Linneman, who is a Roman Catholic, tells us that though he had heard this from many in his store and in the streets, he does not remember the name of a single one who told him that. And when we hear this from him, we understand why he did not dare to swear upon it and shrunk from the idea of perjuring himself. For everyone feels that his memory cannot be so poor as that when he remembers so well the name of the two strangers, Messrs. Conwell and Bennett, to whom he had announced the assassination of Lincoln just 17 years before. But if the memory of Mr. Lindemann is so deficient on that subject, we can help him and tell him with mathematical accuracy. Quote, <clears throat> you got the news from your priests of St. Joseph. The conspiracy which cost the life of the martyr president was prepared by the priests of Washington in the house of Mary Surratt, number 541, 8th Street. The priests of St. Joseph were often visiting Washington and boarding, probably, at Mrs. Surratt's as the priests of Washington were often visiting their brother priests at St. Joseph. Those priests of Washington were in daily communication with their co-rebel priests of St. Joseph. They were their intimate friends. There were no secrets among them, as there are no secrets among priests. They are the members of the same body, the branches of the same tree. The details of the murder, as the day selected for its commission, were as well known among the priests of St. Joseph as they were among those of Washington. The death of Lincoln was such a glorious event for those priests, that infamous apostate Lincoln, who, baptized in the Holy Church, had rebelled against her, broken his oath of allegiance to the Pope, taken the very day of his baptism, and lived the life of an apostate. That infamous Lincoln, who had dared to fight against the Confederacy of the South, after the Vicar of Christ had solemnly declared that their cause was just, legitimate, and holy. That bloody tyrant, that godless and infamous man, was to receive, at last, the just chastisement of his crimes. The 14th of April. What glorious news! How could the priests conceal such a joyful event from their bosom friend, Mr. Lineman? He was their confidential man. He was their purveyor. He was their right-hand man among the faithful of St. Joseph. They thought that they would be guilty of a want of confidence in their bosom friend if they did not tell him all about the glorious event of that great day. But, of course, they requested him not to mention their names if he would spread the joyful news among the devoted Roman Catholics who, almost exclusively, 
form the people of St. Joseph. Mr. Linneman has honorably and faithfully kept his promise never to reveal their names. And today we have in our hand the authentic testimonies signed by him that, though somebody the 14th of April told him that President Lincoln was assassinated, he does not know who told him that. But there is not, now, I am a survivor of the Kennedy assassination. I was 10 years old at the time. I remember everything that day. I remember Miss Beals, my fourth grade teacher, who came in the classroom weeping and crying. And I loved my teacher. And I was crying with her. What could make Miss, Miss Beals cry so badly? And then she said, the president's been shot. And we were all told to go home. <clears throat> I remember everything that day. And this man doesn't remember who told him, who assassinated, that Lincoln was assassinated. Continuing. But there is not a man of sound judgment who will have any doubt about that fact. The 4th of April, 1865, the priests of Rome knew and circulated the death of Lincoln four hours before its occurrence in their Roman Catholic town of St. Joseph. It should be the 14th of April. Not the 4th. The 14th of April, 1865, the priests of Rome knew and circulated the death of Lincoln four hours before its occurrence in their Roman Catholic town of St. Joseph, Minnesota. But they could not circulate it without knowing it. And they could not know it without belonging to the band of conspirators who assassinated President Lincoln. End of chapter 61. We shall stop there for the day, as this is a most moving chapter, and I would like to add a few other facts to this. First, <clears throat> the priests always are at the center of any major political conspiracy. With the Kennedy assassination, it was the Bishop of Dallas-Fort Worth, whose name was Thomas Kylie Gorman, who oversaw all the players in the assassination. Thomas Kylie Gorman was a knight of Malta, and therefore he was subject to his master in New York City, Francis Cardinal Spellman, the chaplain for the, Knight, for the American branch of the Knights of Malta in 1963. It's this same Bishop of Dallas-Fort Worth who oversees the priests Oscar, um, oh, what's his last name? Who is going to give JFK last rites. It's the priest that will oversee Lyndon Johnson because the best friend Lyndon Johnson would have in the office was a German priest named Winnebald Snyder. He was the best friend of LBJ. And Winnebald Snyder is there with LBJ with the funeral of John F. Kennedy. Another one who's at the funeral will be Billy Graham, 33rd degree Freemason and lapdog of the Pope, a thousand times worse than any priest because he's pretending to be Protestant. He's pretending to be anti-Pope. It will be the same way with Carl McIntyre. Carl McIntyre was a Presbyterian preacher, very widely listened to, and he will participate as a 33rd degree Mason in setting up safe houses for certain of the shooters after what took place in Dallas on the 22nd of November, 1963. You have all these players, and the men who actually do the shooting get away scot-free, but they have a patsy just like they had a patsy with the Lincoln assassination. They, they uh, blamed it on, um, on Booth when Booth was a very small player in the assassination, just as Oswald was a very small player in the assassination. All these are absolutely I like, which leads us only to the conclusion that the Jesuits not only assassinated Abraham Lincoln, but they also assassinated our first Roman Catholic president, John F. Kennedy. And I have made this known for the last 15 years, and I only have a handful of Roman Catholics who ever said thank you. 
Not one bishop, not one archbishop or priest has ever challenged me to debate because they know it's true. And yet the American people, and especially the Roman Catholic people, continue to let this crime fester and be covered up with not a man in the country of any true political or academic power having anything to say about it. This is exactly the case with Bill O'Reilly on the Kennedy assassination, covering it up that the fact that the Jesuits were behind it and the Jesuits are the bosom friends of Roman Catholic papal knight Bill O'Reilly. We get the same thing over and over. Again. And my question is to you, my brethren, my friends, when are we going to do something about it? Well, you can do something about it now. Send your donation to RBT, Reformation Bible Trust, RBT, P.O. Box 306, Newmanstown, Pennsylvania, 17073. Or you can be a monthly supporter. Go to my website, 247worldradio.com or vaticanassassins.org, and you can be a monthly supporter. Sign up for that. You can go to my store, purchase some things, some, some things out of my store. They're very helpful for your further education to be able to defend the fact that the Jesuits run America and have committed these terrible assassinations. I want to thank you, my dear friend Betsy out of Syracuse, for sending me that tremendous book, The Catholics of San Francisco. Tremendous book written in 2008. and shows a woman there dressed in black, as a primary supporter of the Jesuits in that city. That's the city the Chinookee said the Jesuits swim in a golden sea in San Francisco. Thank you for sending that to me, Betsy. And there are others of you that can help. Will you help expose this crime? Will you help expose what the Jesuits are doing to us in this quote-unquote election? Will you help expose that they have set up concentration camps and that they're going to kill as many as they wish, when the fascist military dictatorship comes to power? Are some of you Jews, will you help me? Because you're all on the death list. All you Jews of North America are going to die if God doesn't intervene and send a great awakening and men begin to repent and believe the gospel. Will you help me? I need your financial help. But more than that, I need your prayers. Will you pray for me 60 seconds a day? Will you pray that the Lord will Speak through me and use me to the end that there would be a great awakening here and a great awakening of all peoples, blacks, whites, Roman Catholics, Protestants, to the fact that the Jesuits are behind the political empire here. Please, we need to pray that God will move as I believe we are running out of time. So please go to my website, purchase something, sign up with one coin. I'll be covering one coin more extensively and when I get back from... Uh, Virginia, I'll be away to Virginia teaching my class beginning tomorrow, and I'll be back next Wednesday. So until then, please pray for me, give, and lastly, may the Lord bless you as you do his will according to his word, the AV 1611 Reformation Bible, the book of God, and hated by the Jesuit order. Until then, Maranatha. Maranatha.